This material has been reproduced and communicated to you by or on behalf of the Australian National University in accordance with Section 113P of the Copyright Act 1968. The material in this communication may be subject to copyright under the Act. Any further reproduction or communication of this material by you must be consistent with the provisions of the Act. Do not reproduce this material. Do not remove this notice. Good morning, afternoon. I'll come and stand here again. I'm in the habit now after the first lecture where there were no slides, I want to go and stand up the back and look at your screens and do the lecture from there. Um, when we used to have lectures in the forestry lecture theatre, when this course was much smaller, I'd walk around the lecture theatre and I'd even walk into a row. <laughs> And that's when I came to appreciate just how, how few students were looking at the slides, which you don't have to, of course, um, but just how many students were looking at Facebook. So I, I don't need to know that anymore. What I do need to know, though, is that you hate single-use plastics as much as I do, because last week I gave out far, far too many plastic water bottles. Please, I hated every time I handed one out not because I dislike making sure that you're hydrated, but because I can't stand the sight of those things. Please treat water at a prac like a lab coat, safety eyewear, anything else that you would have at a lab or in a lab, treat it that way. Right? It's a, a little bit of water goes a long way, a bit more water goes further, right? So make sure next time you have water, because I'm not handing out plastic bottles next time. Cool? Sweet. Uh, also, this week I would like to, we need to, get feedback from you in terms of how the course is progressing. And a number of you emailed me in response to my email out seeking a course representatives. Now, uh, in this course, because there are 250 participants and students in the course. Um, it's difficult sometimes, and also in a space like this, it, it feels a bit weird, you know, making comments about the course. Maybe, you know, you feel weird about making those comments in front of other people, or you, on the spot you can't think of something, and then you think of something afterwards. Um, it's a, one of the students who responded to my email and said they were happy to collate feedback in the room. I don't know everyone's name yet. That's fine, because during this week's prac times, and I prefer not to do it in this space, because you know what they say is the academic leaves the room early, like at 10 minutes to, and then you guys have a chat about you know the way the course is going and comments, and it's it's anonymous, right? 
for me to uh, make it completely anonymous, I would have to somehow uh, knock out the audio system because comments you make in this room between 12.50 and 12.55 go on to the recording anyway because I can't turn it off. So it is better and more personal if during practicals this week I will respond to everyone who emailed me about being a course representative. It's better that if in practicals I give you time in the middle of the prac to chat and I leave the room and you, we know that it's not there's no recording, right? Not that I necessarily, you know, I, frankly I don't have time to listen to the recording <laughs> and follow up with who that was. And not that I necessarily think that, you know, you know things are going to descend into a, a pile on, but um, you need to feel and be comfortable with the fact that you're making comments anonymously. If you really want to make a comment anonymously and you're not comfortable making comments to a class representative either, on the Waddle site, it's sort of hidden away a little bit, but this week I'll make it quite prominent on the front page. On the Waddle site, there is a link to an anonymous feedback mechanism. Now we can, we can have them embedded in Waddle, but I know how to use Waddle well enough to know that nothing you do on Waddle is anonymous. So every time you do anything in Wattle, a little log is generated, and I have this little um, thing that I see, and I can, in, in a you know, a single click, I can see what everybody is doing, or individual students are doing, when they're doing it, what time of the day, which day, when they open the quiz for the first time, um, all those things. And so anything that I create on Wattle will will leave a trace. We'll leave a trace anyway, but there's an anonymous feedback mechanism that takes you out to uh, a form in, in Microsoft Space, and, and that's anonymous, and you can make comments there, and then I just receive notification that there are comments there. So, so that's there as well. The idea is that we're collating feedback at this point, that feedback all comes back to me, and then we do something about whatever issues, if there are issues in the course. Now, one word about that, it's really valuable that you, that you do that and we, and we act on feedback, but sometimes that feedback can come back to me a bit late. It can come back to me week seven, sometimes week eight, and it's, you know, and the moment has passed. If, if there's something on your mind, I'm, I'm quite happy to talk to you about it directly. So you can catch me after lectures or in practice or whatever. So, I'm, you know, I'm not too unfair. Um, only when I have to hand out plastic little bottles. That's when I come on. <laughs> okay. All right. So, so that's that's that. Um, any questions? Otherwise, before we move on, what is going on with the screen? Eh? G'day. Any questions? Otherwise, before we go on. No. Data from last week's cracks are already online. So if you've forgotten to upload your data, keep it. One person, yeah. yeah. Uh, you'll have to keep that data for yourself as a, as a memento of your experience. Uh, so the data are already online. It includes data from previous years and the prac guides are online as well. Uh, we are going through, we've started marking those uh, graphs and responses to Cook and Edwards um, online. So um, those marks, normally a quiz, you know, the marks are available immediately. They are not in this quiz, or they shouldn't be, uh, because we have some manual marking we have to do, and that'll be done by the end of the week. Now, quickly before I start on content next week, what's happening next week? So it might look a little bit loose next week and things are a little bit looser next week. Who has a lot of assessment sort of around now, say week five-ish? Yeah, it sort of starts to get a little bit lumpy in about week five. For the last four years, in week four or five, we've taken a prac break. Now it's only three hours time that I'm giving you, really, but also the lectures are, are pre-recorded, so I'll record those this week. The intent here is not to be, be slack, but to acknowledge that 
week five tends to be a moment when two weeks are out from the lecture break, um, maybe you've sort of underestimated how much assessment there was, or maybe a lot has come at once, but normally around week five, things start to get a little difficult for quite a few students. And my experience has been that if in week four or five, I give you a little bit of space to handle that, it's better for everybody. So it's better for your engagement in this course, and it's better for your engagement in other courses. It's also better for you from a health perspective as well. So I know that we've only just sort of started, but week five, I'll give you a bit of time. You have a quiz on, of course, it gives you a bit of time maybe to focus on that, or going outside and catching a breath. Um, then you've got a week, and then we're into the lecture break. So really what's happening next week for me, I have to go up to Sydney as well and collect my family and bring them back. So I'm gonna be out of town for two days while that happens, but I'm still contactable via email. It may be a longer turnaround. So if you send me something on Monday, Tuesday, you don't hear from me until Wednesday night, even Thursday morning, don't be surprised. It's, there's a lot playing out over the course of next week. Okay, cool. Well, seems like we've seen this slide before and we have because we looked at this last week. We looked at your data from the blue gum stand and I illustrated this point, that if we take all of your samples, calculate means, those means generate a distribution that we refer to as a sampling distribution. That sampling distribution, because it is derived from a random, randomised sample, should generate this unbiased aggregate around the population parameter. In this case, the population parameter is the population mean or mu. So we have this sampling distribution centering itself on mu, which is a very, very handy thing. It's a product, you've seen this slide before, that's why I'm moving quickly through it, the product of the central limits theorem. It's a very handy thing because it then becomes the basis of using sampling, random sampling anyway, to estimate population values. Here is an example from the importance of being uncertain paper, this figure. If you've had a look at this paper, it's well worth it. If you haven't, it's well worth it. Um, have a look at this paper because it covers the same sort of territory. Perhaps hearing this content from a different author, from a different speaker, is helpful. Some students look out uh, content on Khan Academy websites and so on, just as supplementary, just to get a the same content with a different spin. Right? So that's the value of this paper, but it illustrates the same thing. Regardless of the structure of the underlying population, it has a mean, mu, we, re -sam we sample it many, many times over, we generate a sampling distribution, and it looks like that, always. Of course, what it means is that there is a greater frequency of sample-based outcomes in the middle of the distribution, near the population mean, then far away. And then what that means for us is that if we take, if we look at this distribution, we can say that, we can treat that frequency as a probabilistic outcome and say that an outcome close to the population mean is more likely. There's a greater probability of an outcome being close, a sampling outcome being close to the population mean then far away. That's the key message there. And this distribution is knowable. A known proportion occurs close as opposed to far away. Within this theoretical Z distribution that I talked about in the lecture, we know that 68% of possible outcomes will sit one standard deviation either side of the mean and if we broaden that, then of course we're including more possible outcomes. Two standard deviations, 95.4, and we can keep broadening it out to include more and more. So this gives us a basis to say, well, if I have an outcome, if I sample, it has a, a known probability, there's a known probability associated with it falling within this, this brown sort of tan window. So we can take what we know about the population and we can turn it around and 
apply that, interpret uh, that interpretation to an individual sample. So that would mean then that a single mean, a single sample mean derived from a random sample stands just as we saw in this way. 95.4 of all theoretical sample means will sit in this window, then that means that a single mean derived by the same process stands a 95.4 chance of being in that window. Or mu, the population mu, will be within this range of our sample mean. And that's what we see down below. Now we can refer to it here as z because we have a z distribution or a z score. Z scores are just the number of standard deviations, so our multiplier. And we choose our Z score to give us a defined percentage, a level to which we are confident that mu will occur within, within the interval we calculate. And we calculate an interval, you can see here, mu X bar plus Z times standard deviation and mu minus, so we get an upper and a lower bound. So that's great. We've got that theory. That was last week a little bit of theory around the central limits theorem and you've heard me say that it's incredibly useful but how can it possibly, possibly ever be useful to us in the real world? There are three problems associated with this expression up here. Well, there are three terms and every one of them is a problem. First, if we use as the basis of our understanding or our estimate of the probability of a particular value, if we use the Z distribution as the basis for our estimation, then surely that means also that we are relying upon a theoretical distribution of sampling means, a theoretical distribution based upon an N that is infinite. So an infinite set of samples, like an infinite set of EMBS 1003 students who go out and measure that blue gum stand infinitely. Aside from the fact that it's impossible, you know, nobody really wants to do that. So we have a problem, and that problem is that Z is a score we cannot use. It is a value we cannot know because we cannot draw upon an infinite population. So we need to replace it with something. So first problem is Z. We can't use it. Second problem is mu x bar. If we can't use Z because we can't resample over and over and over, then we certainly don't have a mu x bar, the population mean of theoretical samples. Again, because we're not, we're not resampling an infinite number of times. It's not possible and it's not desirable. So we don't have mu x bar, and if we don't have mu x bar, then we don't have sigma x bar. So in effect, we have this wonderful theoretical equation here that we can't use. It makes you wonder why you had to go through the experience of listening to that lecture. Well, it's important because it sets the theoretical basis for what, what we do next. So what do we do next to handle those problems? So first, let's think about the Z distribution. The Z distribution, the key attributes that we've seen so far, again, here figures from the, the importance of being uncertain paper. We can see that aside from its shape, the spread or rather, let's think of it now instead of spread, let's think of it in terms of kurtosis. You remember when I covered some content on histograms a couple of weeks ago, I mentioned kurtosis. This is how peaky the distribution is. Higher kurtosis has a narrower range and it's a higher peak relative to the range. Now, if we have more samples in our distribution, now this is represented in terms of the number of samples within each, the number of observations within each sample. If we increase the number of observations in each sample, look at how 
more, how tighter, how much tighter that becomes. So the number of observations within a sample here matters. It changes the shape of this theoretical distribution. Now if you want an example of this and you want to play around with it online, this is a nice little, little you know, web toy where you can tool around with Gaussian distributions and change ends and see what happens. Alright, so changing n, increasing n, greater kurtosis, it's more, more peaky, narrower, and that also means that the standard deviation is coming in. And that's all n. n matters here, the number of observations. Not the number of samples, because remember the number of samples here is theoretically infinite. It's the number of observations within the sample. We can use that. In fact, William Seeley Gossett did use it. William Seeley Gossett generated what we now refer to as the student t-table, or student's t-table. It's called students because Gossett was working for it. Gossett was working for uh, a beer brewing company at the time and was prevented from publishing his research outcomes because of previous, uh, previous issues with people giving away industry secrets or something. And so Gossett, he wasn't allowed to publish. He was not allowed to publish. So he produced this distribution based upon the Z distribution, but in this case it was a T distribution, a test statistic distribution that was applicable to small samples. And by that he meant a single sample composed of, say, less than an infinite number of observations. So what he did, he came up with this distribution and you can see the expression of kurtosis associated with the size of the, the sample. So as n changes, as it moves from Gauss's normal distribution, the z here in the black, and you step down from an infinite set of observations down to 10 or 5 or 3, you see how the peak falls and the range broadens. The standard deviation, the variance is increasing as the number of observations come down. So Gossett's distribution has at its core the same functionality. That its peakiness, the kurtosis here, is related to n. So its shape is consistent with the z, and kurtosis still plays, is, is affected by n. But in this case, we don't use n when we are thinking about Gossett's t value, we think about degrees of freedom. Now you've heard about degrees of freedom when I went through that explanation of the standard deviation and you said to yourself, I've heard all this before in year eight, why am I hearing about standard deviation again? Because embedded in the standard deviation were these terms that matter. n minus one degrees of freedom. We have already defined the mean. By the moment we start talking about this stuff, we have already within our sample defined the mean and we remove a stand, we remove one degree of freedom from the data set. It comes out straight away. Remember it is about estimating the standard deviation or the variance based upon a sample and from that content two weeks ago, or a week ago, feels like two weeks, a week ago we know that any standard deviation or variance calculated without that correction, minus one, will underestimate the standard deviation. So to properly reflect the impact of sample size on the standard deviation itself, the shape of the distribution, it's n minus one degrees of freedom. All right, so our z distribution. We know then the way that it's applied is as a multiplier here of our variance. And in doing so, it defines the percentage, you know, in the Z distribution, that original theoretical one, it defined the percentage of likely theoretical or theoretical outcomes embedded in the Z distribution. So for our T, sorry, that should look a little better than that. For our T, 
uh, sorry, for a single sample, we replace that now with T, with Gossett's T, with Gossett's test statistic. So when we get into, <laughs> into running tests using the T, don't call them T tests because it's just a, you know, it becomes a test test. Uh, this is the test, the test statistic. And this is, again, defined for small samples. And we select a T statistic given the level of uncertainty we are willing to accept and the degrees of freedom we have. So the degrees of freedom we have because we go out and we measure something and that's defined by our data. We have n observations, we subtract one, we, we can't change them. And we shouldn't change it after the fact. And I'll talk about that in a few weeks. But how do we handle this accepted uncertainty? Remembering that a, in the z distribution, we could simply just up the multiplier from one to two to three because the attributes of the distribution are known. In this case, how the kurtosis of the distribution is now dependent upon the degrees of freedom, first of all, so we're going to vary that depending on how many observations we have, and then once we have that, then we define how uncertain we, we want to be or we're willing to accept. So we have our observations and then we're defining Given those observations, that n minus 1, what is my analogous, my analogous value for the, t, for the z score? What's my t statistic? So we define that then by a, a term here, alpha. In this case, there we go, those two terms. In this case, alpha is referred to as significance. And it reflects the probability of the population mean falling outside of the interval that we calculate, not inside. Now, the proportion of mu not represented within our sample, or the, the likelihood, there should be probability. All right, so we need, first of all, we need to know the degrees of freedom, and that's easy to calculate. And we need to know our alpha. We need to make a decision about that alpha. And we'll have a look at that in a moment. But if we have variation in two directions now, we have a change in the degrees of freedom as our sample size gets bigger. We maybe have five samples, maybe we have 20 or observations. Five, 20, maybe 150. Down on the left-hand side of a table, we, could, we might imagine, we'd increase the number of observations and our degrees of freedom down one side. And then across the top, we could have a set of different columns in which we have differing significance levels that reflect the level of uncertainty we are willing to accept. And then in that table, we would need to populate it with all of our T statistics. And that's what we have available to us. We have what is referred to as the student's T table. And I'll show you one in a moment. But let's see if we just take an example for a moment of values for T, where we have defined alpha as equal to 0.05. Now, that probably seems totally arbitrary. And if I were to tell you that it is not arbitrary, I, I'd, be, I'd be lying. We use 0.05 as the defined significance level in almost all tests in research, and it is based upon a very, very minor comment that the original proposer made around hypothesis testing. And we'll talk about that in a week or two, in a couple of weeks. But bear in mind, if our alpha is 0.05, that's 5% of possible values of mu that are, might be excluded from the interval we calculate. That means 95 are theoretically inside the interval. So we end up with a 95% likelihood 
that mu is inside that interval, 5% outside. But we explicitly refer to it as a 0.05, proportionate, not percentage, so that we're always cognizant of this uncertainty associated with our estimates. All right. But if we increase our sample size, you can see here from, we never have zero, from one, and we never have one either, from two, I should say, through to say just short of 60, you can see that consistent with what happens to the T distribution itself, the value of T, the multiplier that is now taken in place of Z, it comes down because we are increasing out of degrees of freedom. Now, for those of you who have wondered, or when you do from now on wonder, what is the purpose of increasing n, or how many, how, is my n ever big enough? Well, you can see what impact n has directly on values of t. You can see that once we get down in this range of somewhere around 20 or so, there's not, there's not a lot of movement in the in the T statistics themselves. It's pretty flat from there. It is coming down slightly, but it's pretty flat. All the movement is in this part, in that 2 through to, to 10. And that's why, you know, when we have small numbers of observations, 4 or 5 or 6, there are big differences in the outcomes of the kind of calculations and tests that we can run. So if you have four, you're doing honours, and you've got four, four sites or something, and you're going, well, should I add the fifth one? Add the fifth one. All right, but if we increase n, we get a smaller t, and what that means is that there is a narrower possible range for mu, because it's bringing that distribution in. So any calculation we run, based upon a larger n, will give us a narrower range within which mu might sit, because we know more about the population, right? That's the real world application, the real world connection. Okay, so we have at least replaced T. We're, we've jumped over one of those problems. Now we have the next two problems. One of them is pretty straightforward to handle. The other one perhaps takes a little bit more to think on. And somebody did send me an email about this, asked about what the standard error, or the standard error of the mean means in that paper uh, that I've been putting up on the, on the screen. So let's think about the standard, what we're going to do in the absence of the variance of sample means. So we know that term defines the spread of the sample means. We increase that value and the distribution gets wider. Now in our T calculation, we replace it with another term referred to as the standard error of a sample, the standard error for samples, sometimes referred to as the standard error of the mean. Now, just putting it up there doesn't help. What is it? So first, just appreciate that the standard error itself plays a role in, de in affecting kurtosis. We have two terms that can affect kurtosis in our distribution, and this, and this variance term is one of them. And so accordingly, the standard error does likewise. It takes the place of our variance of sample means, and it's calculated here as, as I've referred to before, standard error, sometimes the standard deviation of the mean. It's calculated using the data themselves, our sample data themselves, to inform on the population. So if we recognise that our sample data are representative of our population, any statistic we derive from those sample data will also be representative. But if we only have a small number of observations, well, then we're going to be less certain about exactly what that value of standard deviation or variance actually is. So we need to reflect that. Now, also at this point, bear in mind that we are not trying in this instance, the standard error, we're not trying to reflect the standard error, the standard deviation or the variance of our data, 
we are using our data to reflect the variance of that population of sample means. And naturally, that standard deviation or variance is narrower than the standard deviation of the samples. How much is it narrower? Well, it depends upon how many observations we have. So we calculate the standard error then based upon the standard deviation of our sample divided by the square root of the number of samples we have. So lots and lots of samples shouldn't have a disproportionately large effect on the standard error. Now we can see what that does. When we throw in larger, larger sample sizes, we can see that if we have a number, this sort of simulation, again from the same paper, it's a great paper. If we increase the sample size, again from here one through to 100, you can see the sample means themselves each time it bumps around a lot when we have a small number of observations. But as the number of observations in a sample goes up, you can see that, well, that variance sort of disappears. And you tend to sit pretty close to mu. And the same is true for the standard deviation. Da -da 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 -da. Bumps around all over the place and then it settles. So you can see how, obviously, again, adding more data, more observations, tells you more about the underlying population and in doing so, tightens, tightens the range of possible values our sample mean and the sample standard deviation might have. And that is expressed, of course, in the standard error of the mean. Of course, in part, it reflects exactly what we've seen in the sample standard deviation because that term, S, is the numerator in the calculation and then we have the square root of n as the denominator. So you can see here, based upon a set of simulations, exactly what happens, again, when we increase n. If you take... I was talking to someone on the way over here about teaching first-year student statistics and I said, you know, really, there are a small list of things that really, when you leave this course, that you should have really, like, you know, burned into your statistical part of your brain. The value of n is one of them. And you can see it over and over and over in everything we calculate. All right, so a larger n, smaller se, again, a narrower range for mu. So the more we can do in terms of sampling effort, the more we can do out there with our... Uh, reusable water bottles, the better. So, <clears throat> here we have our equation again. And again, we're, we're presented with that third problem. We don't have the mean of the population samples. And that's a simple one. We do have a mean for our sample. And we are calculating an interval around that sample. So our revised calculation here is now x bar plus or minus t defined by alpha and the degrees of freedom and se. Now, before I move on, on the Waddle site, on the Waddle site is an Excel sheet that includes an Excel file that includes the data that I used to generate that graph of T statistics. So you can get any stats textbook you like and open up the back and they will have exactly the same tables with exactly the same values that I've got here. You can calculate T statistics in Excel for any uh, level of significance that you're interested in here. There are conventions to these tables, and you'll see it represented over and over and over. You know, here is a 10% level of uncertainty, 0 0.1, 5%, 2.5, 1%, 0 0.1, 0 0.01. And then depending upon our degrees of freedom, you can see that there are 60 here, we can scroll down and select any of these values. So if we selected 
a significance level of 0.05, that column, and then we happen to measure 51 samples. N minus 1 gives us 50. Our t statistic is 2.01. And that takes the place of z. Now, the great thing is that if you scroll all the way down the table, you can see how little change there is in those values of t. You know, I graph to 100, but, you know, I put in a few more than 100. You see, after a while, here, yeah, we're in this column here, after a while, that number doesn't change anymore. So is there value in adding another 100 samples in after you've reached 737? Probably not. Not at all. You're at that end of the distribution where there's very, very little movement in the T. And right now, you probably, your faces are probably belying just how into this you really are. <laughs> You're probably, you know, really great poker faces and you are making it look as though, God, this is boring. <laughs> and you're just going, you know, this presents to me a question, and I have this question, and it is just how low does that value go? It's like the, the limbo equivalent of, of T statistics. Well, it doesn't go below 1.96. If we had the Z distribution, and we defined our level of, uh, of uncertainty as 0.05, as 5%, for a theoretical distribution, the value is 1.96. It doesn't drop below that. So if you were, you know, wondering that just in that moment, I, I could see, I could see that look of desire to know more about statistics on your faces. All right. So we <laughs> we replace the components because we have things available to us, we have sample data, we replace the components, that confidence interval for mu, based upon a sampling distribution, we replace it with a confidence interval of a sample. And that confidence interval of a sample then becomes the basis of us making statements about a likely value for the population mean itself. And there are all sorts of... Sorry, I'll go back if you want to just dwell on the beauty of it for a little bit longer. I saw a wonderful wildlife event in my backyard this morning and I just took a little bit of time out to appreciate that. It was great. If you have never seen slugs mating... Oh, it's crazy. Check out Life in the Undergrowth from David Attenborough. That's... Oh, that's what I saw this morning. Holy mackerel. Right, back to stats. All right, so we're just appreciating, sorry to go back, we're just appreciating the beauty of the equation, right? Slugs out of your mind. Right, there we go, confidence interval. So, Spiegelhalter, there's this great book that came out in 2018, David Spiegelhalter's book, The Art of Statistics, The Art of Data Analysis and Statistics, something like that. <coughs> it's a great book to read if you want to engage with statistics in a non-textbooky, non-ENVS stat 1003 kind of way. It's quite conversational and the approach it takes is pretty good. If you're not sure and you want to maybe borrow a copy, I have two copies so I could lend them out, bring in practice for you to have a look at. And you can see here, this is Spiegelhalter's description of what a confidence interval is, an estimated interval within which an unknown parameter may plausibly lie. Now that seems like law oh, speak, right? Even in a book that handles it well, those key things that he refers to. Estimated, we are estimating using a sample-based mean. The interval, we're generating an interval, plus or minus. The unknown parameter that we're trying to estimate is mu. So this is a dense sentence once you unpick it. May, or well, might not, and we'll talk about being wrong. And plausibly, it is something that we base upon probability to a defined level that we want to be confident to. Now, as I've already mentioned, typically we work to 95% confidence and it reflects a simple statement made by 
what many people regard, who the person that a lot of people regard as the, the father of modern hypothesis testing, Fisher. We'll talk about Fisher later on. In which Fisher made a comment about, you know, what level of significance we, we should apply. And his suggestion was, you know, that for really grave important things, we want to have a really high level of certainty about getting on a plane, for example, and knowing it's going to land in a controlled fashion. But when it comes to things of lesser importance to us, like exactly what the percentage yield or, or yield will be for some quantum of barley, maybe we're willing to accept a little less certainty. Maybe being wrong one in 20 times is okay. And in that moment, 95% was born. Suggestions around how happy am I to be wrong? Oh, you know, if I'm sort of being dispassionate about it and my life isn't hinging on it, well, you know, 5% is all right. And it is now formally embedded within our research practices. How appropriate is it? Well, we'll talk about that later. Now, how does this all work? Of course it works because we have at the core of the data we collect the concept of random sampling. To go back to our uh, discussion around sampling bias a couple of weeks ago, random sampling is the single recognised approach that will reliably deliver unbiased, that is representative, estimates of our population parameters. We need a randomising process embedded within our sampling process to apply the central limits theorem and then everything that flows from it. Confidence <coughs> intervals for a start. So the great things about it though is that we don't need to know much about our population to sort of get going. So for example, if we were to try to describe or capture details around the number of scribbles on trees on Black Mountain, for example, we don't need to know anything about those trees really other than it's on Rossii and then for those lucky people who measured two eucalyptus polyanthemus on those two trees. There's always those two. I've thought about removing them just to keep my model of the world safe. But we don't know anything about those individual trees. And so between me putting a peg in here and a line out there, I don't know anything about that tree that's 200 metres up there. Nothing about this location necessarily is connected to that tree that is distant from this point on this transect. So it is systematic, but between me and that tree, there's a randomising process. That, if you were wondering, was not present in Cook and Edwards' paper. So when they compared between different sites, between different species, does anyone remember exactly how they collected their sample data? How did they select trees? They stood at the top, they walked downhill and measured ones they liked. Now that is the way it goes sometimes. But in that moment, the selection of an individual tree on a site becomes a subjective process. Maybe Cook and Edwards data are fine, but we just don't know. Of course we don't know about ours, but at least ours have the randomising process in between. So if you missed that sampling error in their paper when they were talking about comparing between, that's okay. Because I was just going through the marking on there and it makes very, very little difference to your mark. Like, a, like less than 1%. Right? But this is an important thing for us to appreciate at this point. That Cook and Edwards samples and our samples need to have in mind what we are aiming to test what we are thinking about, and we need to make sure that there is a randomising process embedded in there somewhere. At the tree level, when they measured their scribbles, though, because the trees, they didn't select scribbles within trees, they selected the trees, and then they measured the trees within the scribbles. That's all right. 
because selecting the tree doesn't necessarily tell you anything about the scribble, but it tells you about the presence of the scribble, maybe about the size. It definitely tells you that it didn't have a branch off the side, and maybe multi-stem trees are different. We just don't know. So random sampling, it's an incredibly important uh, component to field work in general. Remember, though, that it can be a very, very time-consuming, inefficient thing to do because a random sample a long way off can be difficult and time-consuming to reach. <laughs>